doing? Yay! <laughs> and this bright Saturday morning that got cold. <laughs> um, okay, so how's it going? Who uh, filled their sheets? Good. Wonderful. Okay, uh, for those of you that weren't here, oh, we kind of challenged last time's class tracking expenses and we said for a week didn't we yeah for how did it go <laughs> yeah okay oh good for you okay so you did you absolutely did everything how did that feel was that weird writing it down every time did you I know you probably didn't spend that much but were you surprised at how it kind of added up Okay, yeah. How about you? How did it go for you? I actually thought that it was kind of weird that I spent so little. Okay. <laughs> All right, so but you then, didn't then, spend that much. Again, I, I don't have that much money to spend, so I'm like, okay, this is good. Okay. All right. How about you guys back there who did it? What, what did you think? How did it go? Okay. Were you surprised or do you pretty much know what you're spending when you're spending it? It was pretty much what I expected. Okay, good. All right, so you're pretty aware of when you're spending money. Anybody else have anything to add? I would have tracked it. I probably would have spent five dollars in tea every week. Uh oh. <laughs> you got a tea issue, do you? Yeah, I get iced tea at school every day. Okay. All right. Well, see that's something you know. And I guess that's the point. And I know um, Kathy Rust said something about uh, a reward, uh, getting, getting um, into some kind of a reward thing with this. I'm not sure she's here today, so will you hold on to these for next time? Okay, because I'm not really sure what she had in mind. But please hang on to these. Just put it with your stuff um, for the classes. And I'm glad you did that. We talked a lot about... Uh, budgeting last time didn't we and and how to <clears throat> create a budget we played that dollars and cents game and I think pretty much everyone walked away with hey this budgeting thing there's a little more to it than I thought right um, <clears throat> when you were trying to figure out well um, how much would I make and what could I afford and unfortunately a lot of you figured that uh, you were gonna have to go and live back at home in order to make ends meet, even though initially you thought you were making pretty good money, right? 15000 a year or something like that. Okay, yeah, that much. <laughs> well, today I'm going to kind of uh, bring in some other ideas about budgeting and creating an account, and then we're going to talk about some types of accounts that you can actually keep your money in, okay? So, so to get started, now, I haven't used this one before. Well, okay. When we play that dollars and cents game, we talked about how what you make isn't the same as what you have to spend. In other words, we talked about gross income and net income and what the difference between the two is, right? So, for example, we figured that if we had a gross income of $15,000, I know a lot of you were shocked at how much you actually took home or what your take-home pay is. So let's, let's figure it out. So if you've got a gross income of $15,000, <clears> that means your gross monthly income is going to be $1,250 a month. Everybody with me on that? It's just a division problem, right? Well, then we have to subtract for taxes and other deductions. And we, we, we know that you might have some voluntary deductions as you move forward, like, oh, maybe for health care or maybe a contribution to a savings account or something. But we're going to just talk about the tax obligations that everybody has. And out of this $1,250, $412 is going to be withheld from you to take care of those tax obligations. So your actual net monthly income ended up to be $837. Okay? And you say, well, <clears throat> the question came up, what the heck? What's going on with these taxes, right? What are they? So, 
So I can tell you that federal income tax, there may be, we have federal income tax, you might have a social security tax on your paycheck, a Medicare, state taxes, local ta taxes, something called FICA. So there's all kinds of taxes that could be taken out of your check every month. And when we started talking about that, I remember a couple of you were saying, well, what the heck? What do, you know, what do taxes pay for anyway? And I, a couple of us just kind of chuckled and went on. But I thought, you know what, I'm going to stop and go back, and I want to I wanna kind of address that, okay? I was able to find this pie chart, and this is recent numbers. This is from 2011. Um, and this is where did your federal tax dollars go? Okay, so that stuff that they held back, where did that go? Well, here's the pie chart, and you can see that most of the budget goes towards defense, social security, and major health programs. And major health programs would be Medicaid, Medicare, and something called CHIPS, which is a, a health care for children. Okay, so that's where the majority of your federal tax dollars go all right by the way if you're interested in this stuff you can google it and it, it'll pop up and you can see what what our current budget is this year going forward by the way who sets our budgets our federal budgets anybody know government like congress <laughs> <laughs> president right Yep, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> That's a whole nother class. Okay, so anyway, so I just wanted to kind of give you an idea of where the federal tax dollars go. And what about state? Now, most states, there are some states that don't, but most states do have an income tax. And you can see that most of those tax dollars go to health and education. Okay. Make sense? All right, so I just wanted to go back and, and kind of piggyback on a question that we had a couple of weeks ago. So that being said, with all of this, this budget stuff, whether it's government, uh, whether it's our federal or our state budgets or our city budgets or our personal budgets, we know that the goal is to balance income and expenses, right? Money doesn't grow in trees. There really isn't such a thing as a money tree. And we work hard for what we have. And so we really want to stretch what we have and make the most of it, right? Because <clears throat> if we don't try to balance, all right, if we don't try to balance and say you've got more expense than you have income, okay, more expense than income, Anybody know what that would be called in a financial sense? Debt. It turns into debt, doesn't it? Anyone else have an idea? Absolutely. It's called a deficit, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. So you've got more going out obligated than you've got coming in. It's called a deficit. What happens when you have more coming in than you've got going out? Surplus. Absolutely. It's called a surplus. The idea is, you know, initially that's a good thing. It sounds like a great thing, right, from a perspective of, you know, I'm not spending as much as I've got coming in. But from a budgeting standpoint, it's not so good to have a, 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 a surplus. What will happen to the money if you've got more coming in than you've got obligated to go out and you don't have a plan for it? What do you think will happen? Yeah, and do you know what you'll be spending it on? No. Junk. Probably not. Right. And it's not really going to help you reach those goals. It's not going to help you become financially secure. It's probably just going to get spent. I mean, we are humans. That's kind of what we do, right? We spend the, the money. In, anyway, that being said, the idea is that we do want to balance. So how do we balance how do we make sure that that income and obligation we try to keep it in check with each other well we've got some budgeting tools out there anybody can you name a budgeting tool that might help us develop and keep a budget calculator okay that's good that budget sheet. the budget sheet absolutely what else those people that like talk to you and 
you hire them to oh like budget. a oh okay so like maybe a a, pers a financial planner or yeah. something like that okay bring it down to your own personal your own personal budget a piggy bank might not be bad, but what? That's to save money, right? What about setting up this plan? How are you going to set up the plan? Yeah, you might use a, a piggy bank to keep your money in. You might use a calculator, budget sheets. What about just old? Because what we're looking for is tools to manage our money. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. And so there's the paper and pencil method. Dead on. Okay, so what do you do about that? Well, you could just keep a simple spiral notebook, kind of similar to this, and make your plan and track your expenses, making sure you stay on track. Um, they actually sell still <laughs> these budget books like this. I'm going to just pass these around so you guys have an idea of what, uh, of what this kind of system might look like. All right, um, budget sheets. You could get a budget sheet and keep a budget this way. Yeah, did you get some of these in your accounting class? Take one and pass that. Take one and pass it. So you're getting the idea you can use your old pen sorry, pencil and paper to keep track of how much you've got coming in what kind of money you got going out, right? What's another tool you think you could use? Anybody? How about spreadsheet? What do you think about a spreadsheet? You guys ever, you use spreadsheets in school, like Excel or whatever? Yeah, so you know with spreadsheet software, you can develop your own, make your own categories. Got it? Thanks. And by the way, you guys, there are extra of these if you want to take a couple. Yeah. Spreadsheet, couldn't you like, even make it into a graph at the end or something? Yeah, absolutely. You can do all kinds of cool things with a spreadsheet, can't you? You can take that data and put it into a pie, pie chart or a graph. You can see trends, it can plot it, right? All right, there are a lot of templates available too. If you just Google budgeting or um, spreadsheet templates, there's a lot. And then if you even put in their personal finance, it will have some categories for you as well. All right, pencil and paper, whatever way you choose, spreadsheets, what about software? You know what? There's a lot of software <laughs> on the market today to help you manage your money, right? These are just a few. By the way, these, they, they range, uh, the ones I have up here, they range from $20 to $60, and they do all kinds of stuff. They'll even, you know, you, you enter the data that it asks for, and it already has all those templates in it, and you can even uh, connect it to your accounts so that um, it can extract data from your accounts. You heard of this? Yeah. Okay. And again, charts and graphs and manipulating your numbers, all different ways to show you how you spent last year versus this year, last month versus this month. All right. There is also another kind that you can use, um, and it is for, it's web-based software right and you guys have you ever heard of like mint.com and that okay so it's sort of like that uh, software that you would buy at the store except you would get it from the web and all of your information instead of being contained in that software package on your own computer it's going to be stored on the web okay Okay, so that's the deal, right? So, so I mean, all of these guys are pretty darn secure at this point. The, it, the this software or this uh, this these programs have gotten pretty sophisticated, in that they are protected software. But in the past, it, it was that the 
com the, the, the program, the ones that you would buy, that would be a little safer because that information was stored on your own computer and there were additional passwords, you know, put in there. But again, this stuff has gotten pretty sophisticated. Now, could it get hacked? Sure. You know, so you, that's something you're going to want to think about. And honestly, you know, we're going to talk about apps too. That's now on your smartphones, there's all kinds of apps to manage your money, right? And um, even, um, you know, mint.com has an app, ver uh, an app version. So my point, when I was looking through this, and my, my point to you is I don't know what they're going to have out there in five years when you guys are ready to start managing your money this way. Seriously, it's changing. It may be more secure than it is now, but I just I kind of wanted to introduce you to these different types of tools that are out there that can help you manage your money. Make sense? Sort of, kind of? Okay. The basic concepts to keep in mind or remember when you're trying to manage those finances are what? Okay. You want to make sure you know your purpose. And we talked about goals a couple of weeks ago, right? So you want, what am I trying to do, All right? Am I trying just to make the most of what I have and not get into debt and spend more than I have coming in? Am I trying to save for a vacation or a car or college? What am I trying to do? Okay. You want to make sure that whatever system you decide to use, it's simple. It's simple. The harder something is, the more likely you'll drop it. You won't keep up with it because it'll seem like work, right? So you want to make it as simple as possible. You need to be able to monitor and adjust those budgets. Remember when we were doing the bean game and the dollars and cents game? About halfway through, I either said, okay, you lost your job, I want seven beans back, right? Or was the dollar and cents game, you know, someone needed new tires, so they had to all of a sudden take $100 from their budget to pay for it. The point there is that a budget needs to be flexible so that you can accommodate your life and whatever you're doing. So you need to be able to monitor it, monitor it <laughs> and adjust it. And finally, make it personal. This is one place in life that you really do need to make it personal. If you are not a smartphone person, you have one, but you don't use it that much. It's just, you know, it's not something you do. Don't download a da a, an app to do it, okay? It, maybe you're on Facebook all the time. Great. Then why don't you go with a web base or buy that program and do it on a, a medium that you're comfortable with, using a tool you're comfortable with. Make sense? All right. That being said, we're going to talk about the type of accounts now that are available, okay? And choosing the account that would best fit you. Just like you would want to choose a method or a tool to budget based on your own practices, these accounts have different purposes as well. When I say accounts, what do you think I'm talking about? A virtual piggy bank. Okay, keep that because you you mentioned that piggy bank before. That's a place to keep your money safe, yeah. right? Where else can you keep your money safe? Yeah, absolute bank, financial institution, credit union, right? That's exactly where we're going. Okay, so so basically there are two main categories of accounts that you can have at a financial institution. There are transaction accounts. That's an account from which payments can be made to a third party. What's this also known as, guys? Checking. Yeah, checking account, absolutely. Then you have deposit accounts, and those are accounts that might earn interest and usually have some restrictions on how many times you can withdraw money or how much money you can withdraw. And I guess the best example of that would be like a savings account. That would be the most well-known. Make sense? Okay. 
All right, so we've got savings and checking. You guys, are you pretty, pretty much know what checking accounts are, right? Okay, cool. So what I want you to do, what I want you to do is go ahead and you picked up a, a sheet um, that said checking account on the back table. The checking account worksheet. What I want you to do is now I'm going to I'm going to want you to work with um, the person sitting next to you, okay, and try and fill this out. And if it's an odd number, then three of you can pair up. But just just kind of kick it around. We're going to take about five minutes, kick it around, and see if you can answer these questions since we know what checking accounts are anyway. Okay? Go for it. Hey, if you need a pencil, let me know. I've got a couple extra. All right, so we just were, I, I just asked you to talk about or, or write a little bit about what you knew about checking accounts. Before I go there, though, re, I remember uh, a couple of weeks ago, we talked about how when you have money in a bank or a credit union that it is insured and it is safe. We talked about why you would use an account. Why wouldn't you just keep it at home in a piggy bank or in your mattress or whatever? And then we talked about, well, what would happen if the piggy bank was taken or there was a flood in your house and all your money went down the street uh, <laughs> or whatever, right? And we talked about how how banks and credit unions are insured. And I talked about something called the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC. Um, the credit unions also have an insurance company, and, that's, and it's uh, run by the National Credit Union Association. But the FDIC, this is the, the headquarters uh, actually in Washington, D.C., and I think there are about eight of the branches around the country, and they oversee the bank make sure that they have enough money on hand and they're not fishy business going on. But they also insure the bank. So it provides individuals a little bit of safety when it comes to their deposits. And someone had asked how much it is insured for. Um, and so I wanted to bring in this. So this is kind of a cleanup session because I'm kind of tying together some things that were questions before. So as far as single accounts go, that's total deposits and all checking and savings accounts you own. It's up to $250,000 it's insured for. Okay? And then joint accounts, it's when you and somebody else have an account together. So what that happens is um, it is also insured up to $250,000. And then like IRAs, which is individual retirement accounts or self-directed deposit accounts, Again, $250,000, right? <clears throat> so, yeah. Are these like all together, all of everything? So even if you get different accounts in different banks, you can't get like $25,000? It goes by account. So you could have in your name an account over here at Bank A. And it has $249,000 in it. Uh, by the way, you could also, in that same bank, have a self-directed deposit account, an IRA, for $100,000. You could have, in Bank B, $200,000 in any kind of account you want, checking account, okay? okay. That'd be really dumb, but anyway. That, all of that is going to be insured because this is a different account over here in A, each account up to two hundred fifty, dollars right? Now, you can't have two checking accounts in your name at the same bank. You can't do it that way, right? But different types of accounts, as well as that's why people spread their wealth around. Not that, you know, any, I know anyone that has, you know, $250,000 in five different places. But um, <laughs> just saying, okay. And, you know, it can get a little confusing because there are different state laws that, um, and, and that would requires so much insurance as well. Did you have a question? Or you? Yeah. Okay. All right, so the FDIC has something called ED. 
And that's the estimator. So you can actually go to uh, this website and it's under FDIC and it will take a look at your checking savings, money deposits, money market, certificates of deposit, and calculate how much of that would be insured. Okay? All right, so that's ED. It's a tool. All right, so back to the checking account. Who wants to tell me what's a checking account? Sure. <laughs> An account from which payments can be made to a third party. Okay, good. Yeah. That's a really great point. You can. Yeah. Yeah, that's the whole point of a checking account, right? So um, as far as a checking account, um, who wants to read this for me? Anybody? Sure. A checking account is a deposit account held at a financial institution that allows for withdrawals and deposits. Money held in a checking account is very liquid and can be withdrawn using checks, automated teller machines, and debit cards. Very liquid. What does that mean? Yeah. Kind of like what kind of restrictions? Mm, like there was a certain account where you couldn't withdraw, withdraw until you retired. And Ex certain yeah, yeah. So you wouldn't be restricted by how many times you withdrew from an account, or you wouldn't if it's very liquid. You could get at it pretty easily without penalty. Does everybody accept that? Food's here, guys. <laughs> It'll be just a second, though. Let Keith stay with me for just a second. I was like, ah. <laughs> All right, let's go to the next one then. If that's a checking account, what's a check? Yes. A slip of a slip of paper that represents money, so that you don't have to carry large amounts of money around. Okay. Anybody want to add to that? Did you hear what he said? It's a slip of paper that can be used to draw money from an account anytime so you don't have to carry around cash. Anybody want to add? Yeah. A check is a call for the bank to get money. This tells them to withdraw a certain amount of money from a certain account. Ah, I like that one. Yeah, you agreeing with that one? Yeah, you know what? You're dead on. It's a written order that tells a bank or credit union to pay a specific amount of money from a specific checking account to a specific person or business. You write the check out to somebody or some business, right? All right, I think we still have time to go to the next one. Oh, sorry guys. We don't have the huge package this time, so Well, you get that concept though, right? It's, it's different from like that ATM. Or a debit card. Actually, that would have been more correct to say. Hey, you guys know what? I'm switching between Spanish and English on this. <laughs> okay, so it's a specific amount to a specific person or place, organization, from a specific account, right? Account, amount, to a specific person. So what is an ATM? Anybody back there? ATM? Auto okay, it's that <laughs> automated teller machine. What can you do at an ATM? Take money. Withdraw money out of your checking account. like Yeah, you can definitely withdraw. It's the money machine, right? <laughs> what else can you do at an ATM? Type in numbers and make money come up. <laughs> Type in number, okay. <laughs> That's literal. Okay, yeah. Um, you can view summaries of your accounts and transfer money from different accounts. Transfer, view account transactions. Any other, anything else? Withdraw, transfer, Deposit. check your account. Deposits. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. Absolutely. You are able to do, um, it's, it's kind of like a, a machine as a teller, right? Hence, ATM. Okay, anyway. So withdraw, you can deposit, you can transfer funds, and you can check your account balances. Oh, whoops. Oh, whoops. 
<laughs> and we have one more, and then you can get your food, right? It'll be a good place to, ch to stop. Finally, guys, what is a debit card? Yes. A debit card takes money straight from your account through an electric money transfer. A debit card will only withdraw what is in your account. Good. Anyone want to add? Yeah. Um, it differs from a credit card because you're not getting billed due to how much you buy. You're, get, you're buying it directly out of your account. Right. You're not borrowing the yeah. money, right? Mm -hmm. It's coming directly from your account. So let's, uh, it is a card and it's issued by a bank and it allows the holder to transfer money electronically, I think you said that, electronically to another bank account when you make a purchase. Now the deal is, the deal is a lot of the debit cards usually have a Visa or MasterCard logo on them, don't they? So that means wherever Visa and MasterCard are accepted, you can use your debit card. What's the main difference again? Debit card versus a credit card, Visa, MasterCard? Yeah. A credit card will take, it'll charge money to the company that you're borrowing from them, and then you'll eventually have to pay it back. But a debit card is taking money straight from your account, and you don't have to pay it back. Perfect. Everybody understand that? Awesome. You can go get your food. <laughs> so we just talked about some pretty common knowledge stuff. What's a checking account? What's a check? What is an ATM machine? And what's a debit card? So we're going to go back. Remember what we're talking about. We're talking about de tra um, transaction accounts and debit ac or, um, uh, deposit accounts. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so here are some, you know, within that checking account, within that um, uh, transaction accounts, there are a lot of things to choose from. You can get a lifeline checking. That's uh, usually reserved for people who are lower income. Um, basic checking, relationship checking, all that means is that you have more than a checking account there. You might have a savings account as well or certificate of deposit. When you have more services it, with that financial institution, sometimes fees are waived and costs are reduced, okay? There are student and senior checking accounts might limit how many checks you can can write just because not as many checks would be necessary if you're not had a household and things like that. Um, express check, interest bearing checking, rewards checking, these are all different types of accounts that could be offered. You yeah, sure. Uh, these are all different kinds of accounts that may be available from your financial institution. So how do you decide, oh my gosh, what do I need, right? So when you're looking for a transaction account, a couple things to think about is what is the average balance you want to keep, all right? Because some of the, like the interest-bearing checking accounts, you would have to keep a minimum balance in there in order to pull any interest on it. Okay. You might also want to think about how many transactions you would make in a month. So like that senior and student account, they're not going to, uh, they, they may allow, I don't know, five or ten checks a month, something like that, versus had a household who may on average write 20 checks in a month. All right, so you want to kind of, okay, well, how am I going to use this account? And then other bank services, you know, does this type of account allow me to do my banking online? Can I transfer stuff from this account to pay my bills electronically? What about ATMs? Do I, do I get a, 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 a card, an ATM card that I can pull? Do, is there um, overdraft protection? Someone earlier said, you know, well, what happens, what happens if I use my debit card and there's no money in the account? Will it get rejected? And the short answer is, yeah, it should. What happens if you're writing a check, though? What if you write a check, right, and you don't have the money? It bounces back. It bounces back. Yeah. It'll bounce, and doesn't the person who received it have to pay a fee? Uh-huh. So when you write a check and there isn't enough money in there, 
two things can happen. The, the, the financial institution can honor it. They can still honor the check, right? It's called overdraft protection. So it might pull from a different account, right? So if you could buy this overdraft protection so that if you write too many checks, it'll still be covered, all right? Or you can, they will reject the check and say, we will not honor this check. Your financial institution look at your checking account saying, this check we will not honor, we will not pay on it. It will bounce back. And then what happens? This check is what's called returned, and there may be an NSF, non-sufficient funds. What do you think would happen if, to me, would I get charged a punishment fee if I wrote a check I didn't have money for? Yeah, I would. And uh, it, it, it's an, oh, it's, it's, um, an NSF. NSF fee, and by the way, we average around $35. So if you don't keep really good track of your accounts, it could end up costing you more money, right? $35 for writing this check that I didn't have money for. So when you're choosing an account, it really is all about the fees and the services that are provided. So there may be a fee for um, maintain the account, just a regular old fee, okay? There may be a minimum balance requirement. They could um, for, there may be a fee for each check you write. Uh, there may be a fee for using an ATM at a different bank or credit union. All right, so when you are looking to choose an account, these are things to keep in mind, all right? And getting to know, you know, thinking about how do I want to use this? Is this a student account while I am in college? Is this going to be close to my own house? Okay, yeah. So if you're withdrawing from an account that needs to have a minimum balance, then Will it let you withdraw it if after the withdrawal is done you won't have that minimum balance? Yeah, usually. And, but then what will happen if you dip below that, that minimum balance requirement, then you will get the fees that you, that you were avoiding by keeping the minimum balance. So say if you had a minimum balance, you were going to get 1% interest on it. You dip below your minimum balance and you no longer will get that 1%. And you may even have to pay to have that account. Gotcha. Okay? Yeah. All right. All that said, let's move on to deposit accounts. Okay? Now, remember transaction and deposit. Now, and there are all different kinds. You can have your basic savings. You can have what's called a money market account, mutual funds, certificate of deposits. Okay, and these are offered by financial institutions. Um, but if you take it a step further, you may want to do more investing than saving. And here are some terms to, I'm just going to throw them out there. Later in this program, you're going to have some investment people come in and talk to you a little bit more uh, about these instruments, these vehicles, okay? But uh, just saving, again, savings accounts, certificate of deposit, money market accounts, mutual funds, bonds, stocks, annuities, real estate, these are all ways to either save or invest money, okay? It's all about how do you know which one? How do you know which one? You want to take a look at the risk involved, what kind of return you might get, and duration. Duration means time. When are you going to need that money? So when you're trying to figure out how you want to save your money or how you want to invest it, you want to take a look at risk, return, and duration. So again, I'm just going to kind of go through this, but you're going to get deeper in it a little later in the program. When we're talking about risk, financial risk, I can tell you that typically the lower the risk 
to you the lower return you're going to get. Return is how much money you make, right? So the higher risk, there's the potential to make more money. But the higher the risk, you could lose your money. Yeah? Is it kind of like the same? It's how if you invest more money into an or if you deposit more money into account, you get more interest, but then once you pass that 250000 then you might not get some of them? Well, no. Okay, we're, that is what's insured in the bank, but you're right, that is risk. If you had $300,000 in an account, that $50,000 is at risk for losing if something were to happen. But you get more interest. Not necessarily. Mm -mm. That's a different thing. When it comes to investing now, investing, that's where risk and return have that um, uh, angle in it. All right. So because the higher the risk, there is a potential you could lose your money. So you have to kind of take a look at your risk tolerance. Yeah. Um, so like, say you have a house that you bought that you're renting out in a high tornado zone. Okay. Would you get higher returns on that, or would people not want to live there? <laughs> yeah, right. Um, you know, insurance, insuring it is a little bit different. What, what we're talking about here is, remember, the savings, uh, your financial risk, and we're talking about savings and investing. Your investment in the, in the vacation home that's kind of the, the tornado, the, the, I'm assuming the reason that you have that there is it's in a desirable location. Let's change it to hurricanes. All right. Okay, it's hurricane, and the the deal is this: um, it's on the ocean. Okay. Now that's a very desirable location for someone to rent, right? But you run the risk of it being blown away by the hurricane. Okay. Here's the difference. Okay. So if it's if it's on the ocean, chances are you're going to be able to rent it out all the time. As opposed to five blocks over, you might have it sitting empty. So in that sense, it would fit that curve, right? But remember what we're talking about right now. We're talking about saving and investing. So, for example, like the stocks. Does anyone know what a stock is? Mm, yeah. small, small percentage of a part of a company and when they gain money or when they're doing well, you kind of you get a little bit of that interest okay. in your income. Yeah. Um, you're basically buying part of the company to get um, rewarded from the, from the board of the Yeah. You might get dividends, right? Yeah. Um, when you buy the small amount if the company's doing well, the value goes up, and you can choose to sell some of it and take the cash. Yeah, so your 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 value goes up. It's like a game of luck. Yeah. So anybody know? Well, okay, Warren Buffett. Anyway, the yeah. deal is it doesn't have to be small. A stock is owning a piece of a company. Okay. So that is going to be a little riskier. The thing with stocks is they're not guaranteed. The value can go up or it could go down. It could go bankrupt, absolutely. Versus a certificate of deposit at your uh, FDIC insured bank, up to $250,000 is guaranteed, insured. It's not insured over here at the stock, but you have a potential of making more. Okay? So that's what we were talking about. You want to take a look at risk, return, and duration. And you need to, when you're looking at how you're going to invest or save your money, you want to take a look at your own risk tolerance. Again, those financial planners are going to come in and talk to you. But if you can't afford to lose the money, then you need to with a safer investment, maybe one that is insured. 
certificate of deposit or uh, maybe even a savings bond of a um, U.S. Treasury bill, something along those lines. Younger investors tend to accept higher risk because younger investors typically won't need that money for quite a long time. And that's the duration part of it. So when we're looking at uh, the rate of return, the lower the rate of return, right, it's usually fixed. So savings accounts, CDs, treasury bills, and, and a treasury bill is basically you're, bow you're lending the United States Treasury money and they're going to promise to pay it back with interest on such and such a date, whatever that maturity date is. Okay? It's backed by the United States government. So those are pretty safe, right? But you're not going to get as much as if you went over here and got a money market account, a mutual fund, or a stock. By the way, what is a mutual fund? You guys have any idea? Yeah, a mutual fund is a, a fund that you can buy, and in that fund there may be quite a few different pieces of a company. All right, so it's stocks that are kind of bundled up. All right, it allows you to diversify and then lowering your risk because all your money isn't going into one company's stock. Okay, all right. That being said, now duration, again, when you are looking at duration, how, risk, return, and duration. Duration, it refers to liquidity, right? And how liquid is it? How, how easily can I get that money? Okay? So as far as is there a specific maturity date, a lot of times there is. A three-month CD, one-year treasury bill, 10-year bond, for example versus no specific maturity date. Again, mutual fund, that is those funds that are, um, it's, a, it's, it's uh, an instrument where a bunch of different companies are within that one mutual fund. Yeah. So essentially, if you had uh, stocks in 10 different companies and five of those companies' stocks went up and five of them went down, then you'd gain nothing. Right, if, if it was uh, same rate of returns and same rate of losses. Right. Yeah. Yep. Money market funds, uh, a money market is an instrument that is um, uh, banks and credit unions have money market funds. And again, there are more restrictions on it than a, a regular checking account, but you can earn uh, a return on it. You can earn interest. And then stocks. By the way, typically the longer you're able to keep your investments in a stock, the more chance you, you have to make money on it because it will go up and down. Okay. We're going to talk about net worth. On the back table, you had, um, I hope, a net worth statement. I already started. You already started it? There is a, an exercise, and I'm not sure we're going to have a chance to go over it today, but that's okay. I want you to start working on it. Net worth is assets minus liability. How much you own versus how much you owe. That's what your net worth is. Why do I care? Why do you care? kicks your door in to take your stuff, you'll know if you have enough uh, stuff to pay it back or if you're going to lose your house. Okay. Knowing your net worth allows you to make wise decisions if something bad were to happen to you. You could liquidate some of your assets. The, one of the things you want to keep in mind, too, is when you have a net worth, it might go like this for a while, but in the long run you want to track it because hopefully your net worth as you age is getting higher. What you own versus what you owe. 